World Medicine Universität. 2017. Acne vulgaris Current Medical Therapeutics. Numerous therapeutic agents have been developed over the years for the treatment of acne vulgaris. Table 1. Although the mechanism of action of some of these agents has not been completely elucidated, most affect one or more of the etiological factors in acne. As research into the pathophysiology of this common disorder continues, additional, more effective therapeutic modalities will likely become available in the years to come. This chapter will present current information on the most commonly utilized medical treatments. Although additional therapeutic agents have been tried in this condition, sufficient data from randomized prospective studies are lacking or incomplete, and some agents are not yet available in the U.S., thus, these agents will be beyond the scope of this chapter. Topical Agents Topical agents are the mainstay of acne therapy. They are frequently used alone in mild cases, but are frequently combined with the oral agents in moderate to severe acne or in resistant cases. Although most topical agents are left on the surface of the skin, some, such as cleansers, washes, and masks, are removed after only a short contact, thus lessening their absorption and, possibly, adverse effects. Benzoyl peroxide Benzoyl peroxide has been available both by prescription and over-the-counter for over 50 years, making it one of the most commonly used medications in acne. It is also available in several commercially available combinations with topical antibacterial agents, to be covered later in this chapter. Numerous formulations are now available with concentrations ranging from 2.5% to 10%, and may be used once or twice daily, depending on tolerability and the use of other topical agents. Newer formulations include microspheres to slow the delivery of the active ingredient and to reduce its irritant potential, and a micronized form thought to improve follicular penetration. Benzoyl peroxide seems to have bactericidal, keratolytic, and comedolytic properties. Its antibacterial properties are thought to derive from the generation of free radical oxygen species. In randomized, prospective comparison studies, benzoyl peroxide has been found to be at least as effective in its bactericidal action as topical clindamycin or erythromycin. No serious adverse effects of benzoyl peroxide have been reported. The most common side effects include dryness, peeling, and erythema. As well, allergic contact dermatitis may develop in up to 2.5% of patients. Patients should also be cautioned about the bleaching action of benzoyl peroxide to avoid ruining their clothes and towels. Although no interactions between benzoyl peroxide and systemic agents have been reported, it is important to note that topical tretinoin, but not the newer retinoids adipoline and tazerodine, may be inactivated when applied concurrently with benzoyl peroxide. Benzoyl peroxide is a Food and Drug Administration Pregnancy Category C agent and should, therefore, only be used in this population when clearly required. Its excretion in breast milk has not been studied. Antibiotics In the U.S., clindamycin and erythromycin are two topical antibiotic agents indicated for the treatment of acne vulgaris. Both are available in numerous formulations containing 1% clindamycin phosphate or 2-3% erythromycin, as well as several combination products with benzoyl peroxide and, in the case of clindamycin, with topical retinoids. In addition, a combined erythromycin isotretinoin gel is available outside the U.S. Both clindamycin and erythromycin are typically used once to twice daily. 
Clindamycin belongs to a lincosamide family of antibacterial agents. Its mechanism of action is direct attachment to the 50s subunit of the bacterial ribosome and subsequent inhibition of bacterial protein synthesis. Some studies have documented detectable urine, but not serum, concentrations of metabolites following proper topical application of clindamycin hydrochloride. No detectable urine levels have been documented with clindamycin phosphate. However, although low, the systemic bioavailability of topically applied clindamycin should be taken into consideration, especially if large surfaces are being treated. Adverse effects of orally administered clindamycin may include granulocytopenia, hepatotoxicity, diarrhea, and pseudomembranous colitis. Of these, only the latter two have been documented following topical application of clindamycin and directly attributed to the medication. Pseudomembranous colitis, a serious and potentially life-threatening condition, results from the intestinal overgrowth of toxin-producing Clostridium difficile. Thus, topical clindamycin is contraindicated in patients with history of pseudomembranous colitis or inflammatory bowel disease. The more commonly encountered and less serious adverse effects of topical clindamycin include erythema and scaling at the application site. These are more frequent with clindamycin solution than with either the gel or the lotion formulations. Although oral clindamycin potentiates the action of neuromuscular blockers, no such interaction has ever been documented with the topical agent, likely due to nearly negligible systemic absorption. Of potential clinical relevance, clindamycin and erythromycin have been found to be antagonistic in vitro, thus, concurrent use should be avoided. Topical clindamycin is an FDA pregnancy category B agent. Although orally administered clindamycin is excreted in breast milk, no adverse effects in infants have been documented with the topical application. Erythromycin belongs to the macrolid family of antibacterials. It reversibly binds the 50s subunit of the bacterial ribosome, thus inhibiting protein synthesis. Following topical application, systemic absorption appears to be very low, with no detectable serum levels. Although common adverse effects of oral erythromycin may include abdominal cramps, nausea, vomiting, hepatitis, cholestasis, ototoxicity, and hypersensitivity reactions, these have not been reported with the topical formulations. Application site adverse effects may include pruritus, burning, erythema, and peeling. Oral, but not topical, erythromycin has been found to prolong QT interval when combined with several other medications, no longer available on the market in the U.S., including cisapride, astimazole, and terfenidine. Topical erythromycin is an FDA pregnancy category B agent. Although oral erythromycin is known to be excreted in breast milk, such occurrence has not been documented with the topical formulations. However, because of a possible link between erythromycin use during lactation in the first weeks of life and the development of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, Caution should be exercised in this population. Although both agents have been documented as efficacious in numerous studies, a recent meta-analysis of clinical trials of clindamycin and erythromycin used as monotherapy for acne revealed a two- to three-fold decrease in the efficacy of erythromycin from the 1970s to 1990s. No similar findings were noted in the case of clindamycin. This suggests the emergence and propagation of erythromycin-resistant P. acnes bacteria. The previously mentioned combinations of topical antibacterial agents and benzoyl peroxide appear to be more efficacious in the treatment of inflammatory lesions and at reducing P. acnes counts, 
and are associated with significantly lower rates of bacterial resistance. For these reasons, implementation of combination therapy utilizing benzoyl peroxide from the outset, rather than antibacterial monotherapy, is advocated by numerous authors. Retinoids Because of their chemical similarity to vitamin A, topical agents in this category were originally termed retinoids. With the discovery of retinoic acid receptors and retinoid X receptors, the term came to be applied to chemical compounds that activate these receptors. Three agents are currently FDA approved in the U.S. for the treatment of acne vulgaris. These include a first-generation retinoid tretinoin, and second-generation retinoids adipoline and tazarotene. Topical isotretinoin, by itself and with erythromycin, is also available outside the U.S. Numerous formulations of retinoids are currently on the market with differing availability throughout the world. Topical tretinoin is available in cream, solution, or gel forms ranging in concentration from 0.01% to 0.1%, as well as the somewhat less irritating microsphere and delayed release gel formulations. Adipoline is currently available as a 0.1% cream, solution, or gel, and, most recently, as a 0.3% gel. Tazarotene formulations include 0.05% cream and gel and 0.1% cream and gel, although only the latter two are FDA approved for the treatment of acne. Outside the U.S., topical isotretinoin is available as a 0.05% gel. In addition, a combination gel that contains topical tretinoin 0.025% and clindamycin 1.2% is now available in the U.S., whereas a combination of topical adipoline 0.1% and benzoyl peroxide 2.5% is currently only available outside the U.S. Because of the photolabel nature of tretinoin, it is usually used at nighttime. Although adipoline and tazarotene are stable under light and oxidative conditions, they are most commonly also used at night to decrease local irritation and the risk of sunburn. The mechanism of action of topical retinoids in acne is not completely understood, but appears to involve the inhibition of corneocyte proliferation and hyperkeratinization in the follicle, comedolysis, and inhibition of inflammation. As previously mentioned, retinoids bind and activate RAR or RXR nuclear receptors. These receptors are homologous to human glucocorticoid, vitamin D3, and thyroid hormone receptors, but have significantly different ligand binding domains. To date, three subtypes, alpha, beta, and gamma and isoforms of each of the RAR and RXR have been identified. Tretinoin binds to all subtypes of RAR and, following isomerization to 9-cis-retinoic acid, can also bind and activate the RXRs. On the other hand, adipoline and tazarotenic acid, the active metabolite of tazarotene, preferentially bind RAR beta and gamma but not RAR alpha or the RXR subtypes. Once activated, RAR may form a heterodimer with RXR, alternatively, RXR may also form a homodimer. Retinoid receptor dimers then bind to specific DNA regulatory sequences, also known as retinoic acid response elements, RARES. This binding appears to regulate directly the transcription of genes involved in normalization of keratinization and cellular adhesion, however, the full details of this complex process have not yet been elucidated. Moreover, retinoids also seem to block the activity of activator protein 1, 
whose potential role in the induction of matrix metalloproteinases and the pathogenesis of acne and acne scarring was discussed in the previous chapter. Additionally, tretinoin, but not the other synthetic retinoids, has been found to bind cytosolic retinoic acid binding proteins I and II. The function of these proteins was previously thought to only include the transport and buffering of retinoic acid in the cell, however, they may also be directly involved in the cellular proliferation and differentiation pathways. Most recently, Tretinoin and adapalene have been found to downregulate the expression of toll-like receptor TLR2 in vitro. As discussed in the previous chapter, TLR2 may be a key activator of the immune response in acne. These in vitro findings will need to be confirmed in clinical studies. Although numerous adverse effects may result from the use of oral retinoids, Topical retinoids are mostly associated with application site reactions. 14. Systemic absorption of topically applied retinoids is low and varies from 0.01% for adipoline to 1-2% for tretinoin and to less than 1% for tazerotene when applied without occlusion or 6% when applied with occlusion. Localized pruritus, burning, erythema, and scaling may occur with all topical retinoids, but appear to be least pronounced with adipoline and stronger with tazerotene, possibly reflecting their relative depth of penetration into the epidermis. Although not available worldwide, the microsphere delivery of tretinoin and the incorporation of tretinoin molecules into a polyol prepolymer 2 gel seem to result in greater retention of the active ingredient within the stratum. Corneum and subsequent decreased rates of local irritation. Of note, application site reactions tend to improve with continued use. Patients should also be warned about the risk of the so called retinoid flare an exacerbation in acne severity, which may occur in the first weeks of treatment with gradual resolution thereafter. Topical retinoids have not been shown to interact with any oral agents, however, greater application site irritation may occur with topical regimens that include benzoyl peroxide and salicylic acid. Also, as mentioned in a previous section, the conventional formulations of topical tretinoin, but not the microsphere formulation or the newer retinoids adipoline and tazerotene, are rapidly inactivated in the presence of benzoyl peroxide. Topical tretinoin and adipoline are both FDA pregnancy category C agents, whereas topical tazerotene has been designated as pregnancy category X. Thus, the use of topical tazerotene is prohibited during pregnancy and proper contraception has to be utilized at all times. It may be noted, however, that reports of pregnancies occurring during treatment with topical tazerotene did not document any congenital abnormalities. The excretion of topically applied retinoids in human breast milk has not been adequately studied and their use during lactation is not recommended. As laic acid is a naturally occurring 9-carbon chain dicarboxylic acid derived from Pedirosporum ovale, but also found in cereals and animal products. It is commercially available as a 20% cream and a 15% gel with the latter formulation currently FDA approved only for rosacea. In the treatment of acne vulgaris, azelaic acid is typically applied twice daily. When utilized in the treatment of acne, azelaic acid appears to have anti-proliferative and anti-keratinizing properties. In addition, its antibacterial effect has also been demonstrated and may at least in part be due to the perturbation of the intracellular pH and subsequent inhibition of protein synthesis. In addition, azelaic acid is a reversible inhibitor of tyrosinase, 
a rate-limiting enzyme central to melanin synthesis. This effect is selective, as highly active melanocytes are preferentially affected by the compound. Consequently, as laic acid is sometimes also used in the treatment of acne vulgaris associated with hyperpigmentation, 15. Systemic absorption following a single topical application of the 20% cream formulation is less than 4%, but increases to 8% when the 15% gel is used. This results in negligible variations in the normal baseline serum levels as determined by dietary consumption. Consequently, only localized application site adverse effects have been reported with azelaic acid. These most commonly include pruritus, burning, erythema, and peeling. Topical azelaic acid has not been reported to interact with any oral medications. Azelaic acid is an FDA pregnancy category B agent. Since azelaic acid from dietary intake is excreted in breast milk, it is unlikely that topically applied agent would significantly alter its level during lactation. Sulfur Sulfur is a nonmetallic chemical element long used in the treatment of acne vulgaris, among other conditions. It is available in numerous formulations and concentrations ranging from 1% to 10% and is frequently combined with sodium sulfacetamide, benzoyl peroxide, resorcinol, or salicylic acid for a synergistic effect. In the treatment of acne vulgaris, such preparations are typically used once to three times daily. However, in the UK sulfur preparations are not commercially available. Sulfur is thought to interact with cysteine in the stratum corneum to form hydrogen sulfide, although the exact mechanism of such interaction has not been completely elucidated. Hydrogen sulfide breaks down keratin leading to the keratolytic effect of topically applied sulfur. In addition, sulfur appears to have an inhibitory effect on the growth of P. acnes bacteria, possibly from the inactivation of sulfhydryl groups in the bacterial enzymes. Systemic absorption following topical application has been estimated to be around 1%. Topical administration may result in localized adverse effects, including mild erythema and peeling. Aside from these adverse effects, the malodor associated with sulfur is frequently a limiting factor in the use of this agent in patients. It has not been reported to interact with any systemic agents. Of note, Elemental sulfur does not cross-react with sulfonamides and can thus be used in sulfonamide-sensitive patients. Sulfur is an FDA pregnancy category C agent and its excretion in breast milk has not been studied. Sodium sulfacetamide Sodium sulfacetamide is a sulfonamide antibacterial agent used in some countries alone or in combination with sulfur. Most preparations utilize 10% sodium sulfacetamide and 5% sulfur and are available as suspensions, lotions, or creams, as well as in the form of cleansers. Like other sulfonamides, Sodium sulfacetamide is a competitive antagonist to paraaminobenzoic acid, which is essential for bacterial growth. Adverse effects from topically applied sodium sulfacetamide typically include local pruritus and erythema. Although not reported with cutaneous use, topical sulfacetamide has, on occasion, led to the development of erythema multiforme or even Stevens-Johnson syndrome when applied via the ophthalmic route. It is contraindicated in patients with a history of sensitivity to sulfonamides, commonly referred to as sulfa drugs. Although orally administered sulfonamides may result in various, occasionally life-threatening, adverse effects and numerous drug interactions, 
these have not been reported with topical sodium sulfacetamide use. Sodium sulfacetamide is an FDA pregnancy category C agent. Its excretion in breast milk has not been studied. However, because of the risk of kern icterus in nursing infants with the use of systemic sulfonamides, topical use during lactation is not advised. Oral Agents Common indications for the initiation of oral therapy for acne vulgaris include patients with moderate to severe acne, patients with acne resistant to topical therapy, patients with acne prone to scarring, and patients with truncal involvement. Antibiotics Tetracyclines are some of the most commonly used oral antibiotics in the treatment of acne vulgaris. These include tetracycline, doxycycline, and minocycline. Limcycline, a second-generation tetracycline with improved oral absorption and slower elimination than tetracycline, is used outside the U.S. and will not be discussed further in this chapter. Tetracycline is available as 250 mg or 500 mg tablets or capsules, and is most commonly initiated at 500 mg twice daily, followed by 500 mg daily once the condition improves. Doxycycline is available in numerous formulations, including capsules, tablets, and enteric-coated tablets, with dosages ranging from 20 mg twice daily to 100 mg twice daily. In addition, Capsules containing 30 mg of immediate release and 10 mg of delayed release doxycycline have been FDA approved for rosacea, but are sometimes used off-label for the treatment of acne vulgaris. Minocycline is available as capsules and tablets, with doses ranging from 50 to 100 mg twice daily. An extended-release minocycline tablet has been approved by the FDA for the treatment of moderate to severe acne vulgaris and is typically administered in doses of 1 mg kg. All three agents have a tetracyclic naphthacine carboxamide ring structure and bind divalent and polyvalent metal cations, such as calcium and magnesium. As antibiotic agents, Tetracyclines are bacteriostatic and act by binding to the 30s ribosomal subunit, thereby inhibiting protein synthesis. It is thought that this results in the inhibition of bacterial lipases, with subsequent reduction in the antigenic free fatty acid content of the sebum. Additionally, tetracyclines have been found to have important anti-inflammatory effects whose contribution to the improvement of acne vulgaris may potentially be even greater than that of their antibiotic properties. As such, tetracyclines have been demonstrated to suppress neutrophil chemotaxis, to inhibit collagenases and gelatinase, also known as MMPs, to inhibit the formation of reactive oxygen species, to upregulate anti-inflammatory cytokines and to downregulate pro-inflammatory cytokines. Minocycline and doxycycline have also been shown to have anti-angiogenic properties, possibly through the inhibition of MMP synthesis by endothelial cells, although this effect is likely more relevant to the treatment of rosacea than of acne vulgaris. The anti-inflammatory properties of tetracyclines have been compared with the subantimicrobial dosing of doxycycline, found to be effective in the treatment of acne while avoiding microbial resistance and alteration of cutaneous flora. The absorption of tetracycline is decreased by about 50% when taken with food, thus, it should be taken one hour before or two hours after a meal. On the other hand, doxycycline and minocycline absorption is unaffected by food. In addition, because of their ability to bind divalent metals, 
the absorption of tetracyclines from the gastrointestinal tract is lowered with concurrent ingestion of dairy products, antacids containing calcium, aluminum, or magnesium, and iron and zinc salts. The serum half-life of tetracycline is 8.5 hours, whereas doxycycline and minocycline are longer lasting, with half-lives of 12-25 hours and 12-18 hours, respectively. Tetracycline is excreted renally, whereas doxycycline and, to a slightly lesser extent, minocycline are excreted primarily through the gastrointestinal tract and are, therefore, generally safe for use in renal failure. The most common adverse effects associated with tetracyclines are gastrointestinal and may include heartburn, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and, less commonly, esophagitis and esophageal ulcerations. Photosensitivity is most common with doxycycline and may be associated with photooncolysis. On the other hand, central nervous system complaints, most commonly vertigo, are often noted with the use of minocycline. Vaginal candidiasis is another common adverse effect of tetracyclines. Hypersensitivity reactions ranging from exanthems to urticaria with pneumonitis to Stevens-Johnson syndrome have all been described, but are more frequent with minocycline. In children, the deposition of tetracyclines in teeth and bones may result in tooth discoloration and delayed growth, thus, the use of tetracyclines in children under 8 years of age and in pregnant women should be avoided. In addition, Minocycline may cause bluish discoloration of scars and areas of prior inflammation, bluish-gray pigmentation of normal skin of the shins and forearms, muddy brown discoloration in sun-exposed locations, as well as bluish-gray discoloration of the sclerae, oral mucosa, tongue, teeth, and nails and black discoloration of the thyroid gland. Less common, but serious. Adverse effects associated with the use of oral tetracyclines include nephrotoxicity, hepatotoxicity, and autoimmune hepatitis, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, serum sickness-like syndrome, and increased intracranial pressure, especially if administered simultaneously with oral retinoids or vitamin A. Minocycline has also been implicated in drug-induced lupus erythematosus and polyarteritis nodosa. Several drug interactions have been described with tetracyclines. As previously mentioned, antacids, laxatives, oral supplements, and dairy products containing divalent and polyvalent metals reduce the absorption of tetracyclines and their concurrent use should be avoided. In addition, antacids, including H2 blockers and proton pump inhibitors, increase pH in the stomach and may decrease gastrointestinal absorption of tetracyclines. Tetracyclines may increase the serum levels of digoxin, lithium, and warfarin, thus, the levels of these agents should be carefully monitored to prevent toxicity. Tetracyclines may reduce insulin requirements and have been reported to cause hypoglycemia. Finally, anticonvulsants, including phenytoin, barbiturates, and carbamazepine, may reduce the half-life of doxycycline, but not the other tetracyclines. Because of the previously mentioned adverse effects on the developing teeth and bones, Tetracyclines are designated as FDA Pregnancy Category D. As well, these agents are excreted in breast milk and should not be used in nursing mothers. Azithromycin, a methyl derivative of erythromycin, is a macrolid antibiotic, which inhibits protein synthesis by binding to the 50s bacterial ribosomal subunit. It is available as 250 mg, 500 mg, and 600 mg tablets, 250 mg and 500 mg capsules, 
as powder for oral suspension, and as an extended release oral suspension. Although currently not FDA approved for the treatment of acne vulgaris, azithromycin has been investigated for off-label use in this condition and found to be at least as efficacious as tetracyclines. The pharmacokinetic profile of azithromycin is characterized by a rapid uptake into tissues from serum and a long tissue half-life of 60-72 hours. Numerous regimens have been proposed and additional studies will need to determine the optimal dosing schedule of this emerging therapeutic option. The most common adverse effects associated with azithromycin include nausea and diarrhea, although their incidence is significantly lower compared to that encountered with oral erythromycin, as is the incidence of candidal vaginitis. Azithromycin is an FDA Pregnancy Category B agent. The safety of azithromycin in pregnancy constitutes a potential advantage over tetracyclines in the corresponding population. Trimethoprim with or without sulfamethoxazole is a third-line agent used off-label in the treatment of acne vulgaris resistant to other oral antibiotics. 16, 17. Singly. Trimethoprim is available as 100 mg and 200 mg tablets. The combined trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, also known as Ceotrimoxazole, is available as a single strength tablet, containing 80 mg of trimethoprim and 400 mg of sulfamethoxazole, or a double strength tablet, with double the amount of each of the component agents. Several dosing regimens exist, with trimethoprim typically administered as 100 mg three times daily or 300 mg twice daily, and ceotrimoxazole typically administered as two single-strength tablets or one double-strength tablet twice daily. The action of sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim is synergistic as the agents block consecutive steps in the bacterial synthesis of folic acid and tetrahydrofolate, necessary for the synthesis of nucleic acids. It has also been proposed that the follicular concentration of trimethoprim, unlike other commonly used oral antibiotics, is unaffected by elevated sebum excretion rates. This may explain, in part, the therapeutic success occasionally observed with this agent despite previous failures with other oral antibiotics. Once absorbed, the half-lives of trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole are 11 and 9 hours, respectively, but may be increased in renal failure. The use of ceotrimoxazole in the treatment of acne has been limited by the perceived high incidence of severe adverse effects most notably toxic epidermal acrolysis. An extensive review of patient data indicates, however, that the incidence of this and other serious adverse effects, such as Stevens-Johnson syndrome, severe blood count abnormalities, and renal or hepatic dysfunction, is likely to be low. Since sulfamethoxazole is a sulfonamide, ceotrimoxazole, but not trimethoprim alone, is contraindicated in patients with documented history of allergies to sulfa medications. As with other sulfonamides, sulfamethoxazole may cause kern icterus in newborns. Most common adverse effects include a morbilliform or fixed drug eruption and urticaria. Additional common adverse effects include gastrointestinal complaints, such as nausea and vomiting, dizziness, headaches, and candidal vaginitis. Ceotrimoxazole can rarely induce hemolytic anemia in patients with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency and trigger an attack of porphyria in predisposed patients. Although uncommon, trimethoprim and ceotrimoxazole can lead to folate deficiency with subsequent megaloblastic anemia and granulocytopenia. Ceotrimoxazole may displace serum albumin-bound warfarin and thus potentiate its anticoagulant effect. 
Concurrent administration of methotrexate and CO trimoxisole should be avoided due to an increased risk of myelosuppression. In addition, digoxin and phenytoin levels may become elevated when CO administered with CO trimoxisole and should be carefully monitored. Both trimethoprim and sulfamethoxisole are FDA pregnancy category C agents, as they may interfere with folic acid metabolism. In addition, sulfamethoxazole may cause kern icterus in the fetus when administered during the third trimester. Both agents are expressed in breast milk and should not be used during lactation due to the risk of adverse effects in the infant. Isotretinoin Isotretinoin, or 13-cis-retinoic acid, is a first-generation retinoid that has been available in Europe since 1971 and FDA approved for the treatment of severe nodulocystic acne since 1982. In the treatment of acne and related conditions, isotretinoin is also used in patients with recalcitrant acne, 18, 19, those who are prone to severe acne scarring, and in patients with gram-negative folliculitis. Isotretinoin is available as 5 mg, 10 mg, 20 mg, 30 mg, and 40 mg capsules, and is typically administered daily with meals that include fatty foods to enhance gastrointestinal absorption. Various dosing regimens have been attempted over the years with the most common one being 0.51.0 mg slash kg slash day for 6-12 months to reach a total cumulative dose of 120-150 mg slash kg. Higher doses, up to 2.0 mg slash kg slash day, may be required for recalcitrant cases or severe truncal acne. Additional newer developments have included low-dose long-term isotretinoin administration, with dosages as low as 1020 mg daily, and various intermittent regimens. Such regimens, however, are associated with a higher risk of relapse following the discontinuation of the medication. Isotretinoin is the most potent inhibitor of sebum production. The mechanism of this action is not entirely clear. In fact, isotretinoin has not demonstrated clear affinity for any of the RAR or RXR subtypes. It has been suggested that intracellular isomerization to all transretinoic acid may be involved in SIBO suppression. Alternatively, the effect of isotretinoin on SIBO sites may be independent of the retinoid receptors. Isotretinoin has been shown to reduce androgen receptor binding capacity and the formation of dihydrotestosterone, which regulates sebum production. RAR independent cell cycle arrest and apoptosis have been demonstrated in SIBO sites exposed to isotretinoin. Once absorbed, isotretinoin is mostly bound to albumin in plasma. Its elimination half-life is approximately 20 hours and, unlike vitamin A and fat-soluble retinoids, isotretinoin is not stored in the liver or the adipose tissue. The metabolism of isotretinoin occurs mainly in the liver, where it is oxidized to 4-oxoisotretinoin. In addition, tretinoin and its metabolite, 4-oxotretinoin, may also be produced in smaller amounts. Isotretinoin and its metabolites are then excreted in urine and feces, reaching their naturally occurring concentrations within two weeks following the discontinuation of the agent. Numerous adverse effects are associated with the use of oral isotretinoin. Many of the side effects resemble clinical manifestations of hypervitaminosis A. The most serious adverse effect is retinoid teratogenicity, which recently prompted the launch of a mandatory online compliance program in the U.S. Fetal exposure to isotretinoin may cause stillbirths or spontaneous abortions. 
Nearly 50% of the infants exposed to the agent during the first trimester and delivered at full term are affected, with the most common abnormalities being auditory, cardiovascular, craniofacial and musculoskeletal, ocular, central neural, and thymic. Since there is no established teratogenic threshold for isotretinoin, Females of childbearing potential have to be counseled on pregnancy prevention, with two forms of contraception being mandatory for the initiation of therapy. As well, the proper use of contraception must be ascertained at each monthly visit. Two negative serum or urine pregnancy tests are mandatory in the U.S. prior to starting oral isotretinoin. In addition, a pregnancy test has to be repeated monthly for the duration of therapy, as well as one month following the discontinuation of treatment to allow for the washout period. Common mucocutaneous adverse effects of oral isotretinoin include dryness of the lips, mouth, nose, and eyes. Mucosal dryness and fragility can then lead to epistaxis, conjunctivitis, corneal ulcerations, and superinfections with Staphylococcus aureus. Additional ophthalmologic findings may include altered night vision and photophobia. Xerosis of the skin and photosensitivity are frequently observed, as are nail fragility and occasional telogen effluvium. In addition, an elevated incidence of delayed wound healing and colloidal scar formation following surgical or laser procedures on patients taking oral isotretinoin has been noted. This may be related to the previously mentioned modulation of MMP expression by retinoids, specifically, lower expression of collagenases may lead to excessive scar tissue deposition. Excessive granulation tissue with subsequent keloid formation has also been observed in severe cases of acne conglobata and acne fulminans upon initiation of isotretinoin therapy. For this reason, pretreatment with systemic corticosteroids for up to six weeks is recommended in such instances. Additionally, acne flares varying in severity from mild to severe including acne fulminans, have been reported with oral isotretinoin. The most common musculoskeletal adverse effects include bone pain, as well as myalgia and muscle cramps, especially after strenuous exercise. Most of these complaints are minor and have no long-term sequelae. Several reports suggest, but do not definitively prove, an association between long-term use of isotretinoin and the development of diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis syndrome, characterized by the formation of largely asymptomatic hyperostoses of the spine, as well as calcification of tendons and ligaments, such as that of the anterior spinal ligament. Children on high dose Long-term oral isotretinoin can develop premature partial epiphyseal closure. On the other hand, isotretinoin does not appear to induce osteoporosis or other abnormalities of bone mineral density. Adverse effects involving the central nervous system are exceedingly rare. However, a complaint of persistent headache, especially when accompanied by nausea, vomiting, and blurry vision, should prompt an immediate ophthalmologic evaluation to rule out papilledema associated with pseudotumor cerebri. This complication is most common when isotretinoin is CO administered with oral tetracyclines, thus, their concurrent use should be avoided. The association between oral isotretinoin intake and psychiatric disturbances most notably depression and suicidal ideation, has been highly controversial. Although several reports have appeared in the literature, it has been argued that some patients with severe and debilitating acne requiring oral isotretinoin may have baseline depressive symptoms prior to therapy. As of now, extensive reviews fail to establish a causative association.
Serious gastrointestinal and hepatic adverse effects are rare, although nausea, diarrhea, and mild transient elevation of transaminases are somewhat more common. Liver function tests should be obtained at baseline, however, it is unclear whether additional tests at follow-up visits are necessary. If laboratory monitoring of liver function is undertaken, the medication should be temporarily withheld if two to three-fold elevation in hepatic enzymes is noted, and discontinued if greater than three-fold elevation is documented. On rare occasion, a flare of inflammatory bowel syndrome in patients treated with oral isotretinoin has been reported, however, the causal relationship has not been demonstrated in prospective studies. Finally, several cases of pancreatitis associated with isotretinoin-induced hyperlipidemia have been reported, suggesting the NAE for further investigations in patients with abdominal pain while on the medication. Lipid profile abnormalities, primarily hyper, triglyceridemia and hypercholesterolemia, are common during oral isotretinoin therapy. Most cases do not require clinical intervention, however, dietary adjustments and the addition of lipid-lowering agents, such as gemfibrozil, may be considered in some patients. It is recommended that lipid profile be monitored monthly for 3-6 months and every 3 months thereafter. Triglyceride or cholesterol elevation above 6.78 mol/l or 7.7 mol/l, respectively, should prompt a temporary withholding of the medication until the values are normalized. Blood count abnormalities are rare, however, leukopenia and occasional agranulocytosis have been reported with the use of oral isotretinoin. Because of the relative paucity of such adverse effects, the optimal hematologic monitoring schedule, if any, is not clear, except in patients with human immunodeficiency virus, in whom frequent testing is recommended. Toxicity from oral isotretinoin may be increased by concurrent administration of vitamin A supplementation. As previously mentioned, the risk of pseudotumor cerebri is significantly elevated when tetracyclines and isotretinoin are combined. Additionally, various inhibitors of CYP3A4, a hepatic enzyme involved in the metabolism of isotretinoin, are expected to elevate the serum level of the agent. On the other hand, inducers of the enzyme, including rifamin and anticonvulsants, may decrease isotretinoin to subtherapeutic levels. Concurrent administration with methotrexate is not recommended due to the combined risk of hepatotoxicity. Because of its severe teratogenic potential, oral isotretinoin is an FDA pregnancy category X agent, and its use in the U.S. is tightly regulated through the previously mentioned online monitoring system. Isotretinoin is absolutely contraindicated in nursing mothers. Hormonal therapies Hormonal agents may be used in women for the treatment of acne regardless of the baseline serum androgen levels. They are especially useful in inflammatory acne resistant to oral antibiotics and in women with significant flares prior to their menstrual periods. Hormonal therapies used in the treatment of acne in women are divided into inhibitors of androgen production and androgen receptor blockers. The most commonly used inhibitors of androgen production are oral contraceptives. Agents used in the treatment of acne are comprised of a combination of an estrogen, typically ethanyl estradiol, and a synthetic progestin. Of the progestins, the first-generation agents, such as norgestrol, have an intrinsically high affinity for androgen receptors. The second-generation agents are associated with lower androgenicity and include norethindrone, levonorgestrol, and ethenodiol diacetate. 
The newest synthetic progestins have very low or no androgenic potential and include desogestrol, norgestimate, gestodin, and drispirinone. Additionally, an oral contraceptive agent consisting of ethanyl estradiol and cyproterone acetate, a derivative of 17-hydroxyprogesterone with antiandrogenic properties and weak progestational activity, is currently available outside the U.S. Both the combined contraceptive and singular formulations of cyproterone acetate have been successfully used in the treatment of acne. At higher doses, estrogen can suppress sebum production. However, because of a higher incidence of adverse effects associated with such doses, the current trend has been to lower estrogen content to 2035 mg per dose. At these levels, the mechanism of action appears to be increased liver production of sex hormone binding globulin, with subsequent decrease in the circulating levels of free testosterone, and decreased adrenal and ovarian androgen production through negative feedback and suppression of ovulation. The most common adverse effects associated with the use of oral contraceptive agents include nausea, headaches, weight gain, abnormal menses, mood changes, and breast tenderness. Extensive epidemiological studies have investigated the risk of the more serious adverse effects of oral contraceptives, including venous thromboembolic events, myocardial infarction, and stroke. These studies confirmed that the risk of myocardial infarction and stroke is not elevated in the users of oral contraceptives containing less than 50 mg of ethanyl estradiol. The exception to this finding is smokers over the age of 35 years, in whom the risk is unacceptably high and who should not, therefore, be prescribed combined oral contraceptives. All oral contraceptives have been found to carry a small, but measurable, excess risk of venous thromboembolism. In addition, it appears that the use of agents containing desogestrol or gestodin doubles this risk, however, no cause and effect association has been established. Although some analyses seem to indicate an association between long-term use of oral contraceptives and slightly elevated risk of breast, cervical, and hepatocellular cancers, these findings remain controversial. Failure of oral contraceptives in the prevention of pregnancy may occur when CO administered with inducers of hepatic cytochrome P450 enzyme, such as phenobarbital, rifampin, and griseofulvin. Although isolated reports suggested a possible reduction in contraceptive efficacy in the presence of oral antibiotics such as tetracyclines, the actual failure rate is no greater than the one expected in the general population. Spironolactone is a synthetic steroid most resembling mineralocorticoids. It is FDA approved for diuresis for various indications. It has, however, also been used off-label for the treatment of acne for over 20 years. It is available as 25 mg, 50 mg, and 100 mg tablets. Additionally, topical cream and lotion preparations containing 5% spironolactone are available in some countries outside of the US and the UK. Dosages most commonly utilized in the treatment of acne are 5200 mg per day which may be subdivided into morning and evening doses for lower incidence of adverse effects. Spironolactone is primarily an aldosterone antagonist that is also a progestin, a weak androgen receptor blocker, and an inhibitor of androgen synthesis. In addition, spironolactone inhibits the enzyme 5-alpha reductase, responsible for the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, and significantly reduces sebum production. While the oral bioavailability of the agent is good, its gastrointestinal absorption may be further improved by CO administration with food. 
Spironolactone is metabolized in the liver to several active metabolites, including 7-alpha-thiamethylspironolactone, canrenone, and 6-beta-hydroxy-7-alpha-thiamethylspironolactone, which are then excreted in urine and bile. Although adverse effects are common with spironolactone, occurring in up to 90% of patients, most are mild and without long-term sequelae. While diuresis is an expected occurrence with the use of oral spironolactone in the treatment of acne, common adverse effects include fatigue, headaches, vertigo, menstrual irregularities, and breast tenderness. Most incidences of menstrual irregularities frequently resolve spontaneously over 2-3 months, however, an oral contraceptive may be added if the symptoms are bothersome to the patient. Most adverse effects are dose-dependent and may improve or resolve completely with lower dosages. Less common adverse effects include nausea, vomiting, confusion, decreased libido, orthostatic hypotension, and hyperkalemia. Clinically significant hyperkalemia is unlikely in young healthy women, but may be of potential concern in older patients those with renal insufficiency, or with concurrent administration of oral potassium supplementation. Specific monitoring guidelines for serum potassium are lacking because of the low risk of this complication, if considered, potassium level may be checked at baseline and repeated early into therapy. It is also important to note that the FDA has placed a warning on the package insert of spironolactone as neoplastic potential in rats has been demonstrated with extremely high doses of the agent. Although a concern about breast cancer risk in patients on oral spironolactone has been raised on one occasion, the risk has subsequently been shown to be equivalent to the one in the general population. Although relatively few drug interactions are clinically important, the risk of hyperkalemia from the use of oral spironolactone is increased when the agent is administered concurrently with potassium supplements or angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors. Serum concentration of digoxin and lithium may increase to potentially toxic levels when CO administered with spironolactone and should, therefore, be carefully monitored. Spironolactone is an FDA pregnancy category C agent and should not be administered during pregnancy due to the risk of feminization of a male fetus. Oral contraceptives represent a convenient approach to decrease the risk of pregnancy and to add to the clinical efficacy of spironolactone in clearing acne. The active metabolites of spironolactone have been detected in breast milk, thus, its use in nursing mothers is discouraged. Additional hormonal therapies occasionally tried in the treatment of acne vulgaris include flutamide, a nonsteroidal antagonist of the androgen receptor, luprolide, and other gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists, and finasteride, an inhibitor of 5-alpha reductase type 2. At the present time, Solid data from large clinical trials supporting such use are lacking for these agents. Future studies may confirm or refute their clinical benefit in this condition. World Medicine Universitet. 2017